substance abuse and helping families impacted by addiction. Marsha also leads the Partnerships for Medicine Abuse Project, a communications and education campaign aimed at reducing teen initiation of prescription drugs and over-the-counter cough medicine abuse by half a million. Previously, she served as the Senate, or, excuse me, as the Senior Advisor for Drug Policy and Research for the Senate Judiciary Subcommittee on Crime and Drugs and the Democratic Staff Director of the Senate Caucus on International Narcotics Control, working for Senator Joseph Biden. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's so, it's so wonderful to be here today. I was just saying a moment ago that in um, my 11 years working as a Senate staffer doing drug policy, um, I used to see disease groups come in and out of the office to meet with all of my other colleagues. And um, you know, my, my issue was, our issue um, was different. Um, there, were, uh, there were PhDs, there were law enforcement, um, there was the occasional family member, but there wasn't a stampede. And I can't tell you um, that how much this is beyond my wildest dreams, that we have a, a forceful stampede of families who are going to the hill today. So um, thank you all for being here. Um, I always said um, in my life as a staffer that policy is made, the recipe for policy is, is one part data and one part anecdote. Um, so I think that um, what you're bringing today is the anecdotes that are going to stick with people, that are going to haunt staffers and say, you know what, we really need to fight harder for, for, for X, Y, or Z and all the things on our, on our mocking list today, so, so thank you. Um, I'm with the Partnership for Drug Free Kids. For those of you who don't know about the partnership, we were created 31 years ago by the advertising industry. And the idea was to use the creative power of advertising <coughs> to unsell drugs. Um, and, and during that time, we really morphed, especially in the past 10 years, when we created deep resources for families. Everything we do at the partnership now is geared towards helping families um, and making sure that they are empowered with what they need. We still do PSAs, but it's really to make families aware of the resources that we've developed to help them. Um, I do have, in a moment, there'll be, there'll be some fancy slides up there. Um, oh, there, right under you. Um, so th there'll be some things, and, and I'll point you at the end. We, I go through some data that is just easier to look at when we have some bar graphs. Um, why do we focus on parents? We focus on parents because we know that they're the number one influence on their kids. Um, we know that they're, most, they're their child's most important advocate, and then we, know, we know that with addiction, like any other disease, when parents are empowered and informed, there are better outcomes for their children. So that's why we really have decided that we um, you know, have, have, have parents at the heart of, of what we do, because we want to make sure that they are able to advocate in the most effective way for their kids. This is a really difficult, murky, you know, backwards um, system that we're all trying to navigate, and we want to make sure that we're helping as much as possible. Our, our methods are based on craft and motivational interviewing, and, and for those who aren't familiar with them, they really um, turn, uh, turn the, the idea that you need to let your child hit rock bottom on its head. And we help parents, we know, you know as a mom, when, when there's something wrong with, with one of my daughters, I want to bring them as close to me as possible. I don't want to put them at arm's length. And when a child is going through um, a difficult time, we want to be there for them, we want to love them through it. So that's really at the heart of what craft is. It's about how we can um, change the, the dynamic in a family so that there's less door slamming, less screaming, and, and more love and more focus on how we can work together as a unit to get help for a child. We are constantly talking to parents in the partnership and running things by them um, and making sure that our resources resonate. And, you know, as all of you take a look at what we have and what we offer, I'd love to hear from you and hear that feedback because if there's something that we could be doing better, we want to make sure that we are. We're also talking to the experts in the field and getting the latest and greatest science. We know that when anyone is going through a health crisis, the last thing they can possibly do is read a journal article mm -hmm. um, because you want something that's quick and easy to digest. So we use that 31 years of communications expertise to boil down the latest science into tangible tips and tools, into videos with some of the, the leading experts in our field so that people can hear one-on-one -on -one in really simple terms 
what they need to do to get their arms around the issue and to be able to help their families find recovery. Um, and then, of course, we hold ourselves accountable by measuring our impact. We really have three main buckets of resources. The first is our parent support helpline. Um, this is not a crisis helpline. It's not um, you know akin to calling 911 and, and getting that, that urgent, critical, I need your help this second. It's really when a parent wants to formulate a plan, wants to, um, wants to take a step to get help for their child, and they don't know what to do. They need support. They need someone who's going to listen to them and not judge them. They need to know they're not alone. And that's what our, our helpline specialists do. We have uh, master's level specialists who are bilingual. Um, right now, we operate from 9, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Our goal is to increase that more. We've just started a online chat feature um, so that uh, families can also um, text us and, and, and have online chat um, as another way of, of communicating. We point people to resources and we help them come up with a plan about how, how best to help their kids. And again, really looking at that craft and motivational interviewing mindset and philosophy as, as, the, as the organizing principle of, of these conversations. For the people who call our helpline, um, we also have, uh, we also can connect them to a series of parent coaches, some of whom are here today. And they're really um, amazing, giving, wonderful people who've been there. Um, we know that with addiction, uh, you don't always want to talk to the neighbors about the problem. Um, you don't want to go and talk to um, the, the, the friend on your street whose kid is doing everything right and doesn't have any problems or any bumps in the road. You want to talk to someone who's walked a mile in your moccasins. And that's what our parent coaches do. Um, we offer a free series of five phone calls over um, about a six week period where we walk through the principles of motivational interviewing craft and talk about how to change that family dynamic. We know that the end goal is to get help for our kids and to make sure that they're living a life in recovery, but there are a lot of really important steps along the way that somehow sometimes gets kind of brushed over. Um, things like um, having, making sure that you're in touch with your child, um, that there's communication. Um, one of the core principles of craft is that idea of putting your oxygen mask on first, making sure that parents understand and get permission that it's okay to take care of yourself and you need to take care of yourself if you're gonna be able to help your loved one. So um, our, our coaches are amazing. They're, we we go, put them through a rigorous training. Right now there are about 90 of them throughout the country and we're holding additional trainings this year to build up that force so that we can help more and more families. Um, the third bucket of, of sort of resources that we have uh, are found on our website, drugfree.org. Uh, we're about to launch a revised version of the website in a few weeks, so I encourage you to check it out now, but also come back um, and, and check it out again, where it's really um, more focused on families. We, we were um, you know, doing a lot of different things with our website, and now we're just having that single focus of, of how we can help families and make sure when, when a mom or dad arrives on our website, they know that we get them and, and we get this problem, and, and we're here to help and support them um, through their journey. Um, so there are a number of different things, I won't go through all of them, but um, a number of ways that parents can get help. We have resources on medication-assisted treatment, on questions you need to be prepared to ask the treatment center when you first call them. We know that um, there are a lot of glossy brochures and um, what I call the, the, the car wash promise. You know, send your kid in dirty, won't bring them out clean, and you know, give us 40 grand and, and you'll be set for life. Um, we know that parents need to be discerning consumers when they make those phone calls because, as we heard yesterday, a lot of times these, um, these decisions require taking out a second mortgage on the home or asking family or friends for help paying for it. So we want to make sure that they're getting the best resources possible. Um, we also have a series of community education tools and um, documentaries on our Medicine Abuse Project um, website um, that, that are helpful as well for families who are at that point where they want to be speaking out in the community and making sure they're educating others, and this gives them really good tools. So this is the part where we come to the, the slides, um, just to sort of give you um, a sense of things. Um, we, we did a, a follow-up survey with some of our, our helpline um, callers, and it's, it's like the very end ones with their bar charts. Um, and you know, getting back to that point of we obviously having a child well and um, you know living a life in recovery is is the ultimate goal. But again, looking at what are those other pieces that are really important, 
We know that um, our, our health fund callers report that because of the help they've gotten from us, they're having fewer arguments with their kids. And in the next slide, um, that, that they're, they're understanding more uh, about why their kids might be doing what they're doing. Um, they're less fearful to act. They're more confident in having these discussions with their kids. They report increased self-care, which is so important and critical to being able to have a sustained impact with your child. They're less consumed with worry. And then finally, they're more hopeful. And we know that all of what we do, there's so much doom and gloom what, at the heart of what the partnership wants to do and what all of our parent partners and parent coaches constantly remind us, bring hope. Make sure people have hope. Because so many of the messages we get in society is, oh, gosh, I don't know, it's not gonna end well. Um, and, and we know that parents need that nugget of hope so, and, and need the resources to give them hope. So um, I think of all of the outcomes that, that we measure, that's the one that we're proud of, that, 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 uh, that our resources are able to give people more hope. So thank you again for being here today. Thank you for telling your stories. I know this is gonna be a really long day. It's gonna feel like a week um, by the time you get to the reception tonight, but it is so important and so meaningful. So thank you. Sis Wenger from the National Association of Children of Alcoholics. Sis has been president and CEO of the National Association of Children of Alcoholics for most of the last 25 years. There, Sis has written numerous articles published across disciplines, edited, co-authored, and contributed to books, journals, and program materials. In addition to addition, addiction, to her, uh, in addition to her ad advocacy and leadership roles at uh, the uh, National Association of Children. Oh, that's quite a, what do you call that? What's the The co op. The co op. Call it the co op. She has uh, published many, many things. Uh, we want to try to get through all of this, so we'll try to keep it as short as we can and keep moving. Yeah. Thank you very much, sis. Uh, good morning, and thank you all for sitting. Good morning. Is that better? Thank you. Uh, before I start, I want to say that it is so encouraging to me, for have to, after being in this field for so long, to have Marsha tell you what she just told you. I was around when the first marijuana epidemic started, uh, and it was the parent movement. If you look at any chart of the history of kids using, it was the parent movement that, that drove the, that use way down. Parents are, were critical then, 25, 30 years ago, and they're super critical today. So thank you for your work, helps us all. Um, Nicole calls ourselves, we call ourselves the voice for the children. Uh, we are very aware, even after almost 35 years of being in existence, that when people address the issue of addiction, and this has been true across the decades, they, the, the people who are hurt first are the children when addiction is a family, and they are the last ones helped if they're helped at all which helps to set up the dynamic for their becoming the addicts that they are living with today. So we are really in the business of helping to save children from the chaos and the confusion and the unpredictability and irrationality that they live with every day because that's what addiction does to family members and those of you in those families, no matter where the addict is in the family, that you know that that's true. For children, it is far more damaging because their brains are so young and in such early development and the chronic emotional stress of living in addicted or other highly chaotic families changes the way the brain forms and dramatically impact, impacts the life of the, of the child all the way through. They have more mental health problems, they have more addiction problems, they have more relationship problems as adults, in the general population. So that's why we're here. We're trying to prevent all the war off and save some money from more serious problems. Uh, I, you know, as, uh, as Marcia said, uh, uh, stories really make a difference. So let me just tell you a few brief stories and make my points with that. We have a new program director at the COA. Her name is Mary Beth. She's actually leading a group to see their uh, legislators this morning. Uh, when Mary Beth was in high school, she's a student leader, she was on the soccer team, uh, and she had a Marine officer father who was an alcoholic. And she, 
couldn't tell anybody that. She, she followed the family rules of don't talk and don't trust and don't deal and moved ahead. And a teacher called her one day and said, you know, Mary Beth, there's a group of kids that meet here every week. I think you might enjoy meeting them. And she didn't know what she was going to, but she loved this teacher, so she went to the group. And when she walked in, the captain of the football team was sitting there. One of her teammates on the soccer team was sitting there, and one of her class leaders was sitting there. And she couldn't believe it when she listened to their stories, because those were her stories. And she said to me, when, after she worked for us for a while, she said, you know, it was because of what you do, which was why I tried to get this job. And she said, if it weren't for that group, that student assistance group in high school, I wouldn't be here today, I wouldn't have a life. Student assistance. On our website, there's a book that's a manual for creating student assistance. Student assistance programs were running in this country for years, saving countless lives. They, were, they made alternative suspension groups, sort of the high school version of diversion we have in drug courts now. Um, and they were eminently successful. And wherever they were in, implemented appropriately, there was increase in academic improvement, there were decreases in people coming late to school and in people missing school. The whole atmosphere of the school got better. And that was the prevention, they created a prevention atmosphere, not, um, not a trouble atmosphere. Uh, let me tell you about Larry. Larry's father, Larry came from a very successful father or family. Uh, Larry's father was alcoholic, he was also a sex addict who uh, was abusive within his family and externally as well. His father's alcoholism was treated and he went on to continue to be a great corporate executive. What was not treated was the sex addiction. And when Larry grew up, no one ever helped him. Nobody ever told him anything. There was no program for him in, in the treatment center where his father went. He was supposed to be glad his dad was sober. Larry became a sex addict. He had two wives, both of whom left him and took the children with him. That's the generational transmission of the chaos that comes in, a, in addicted family systems. A few months ago, in September, a 10-year-old girl stood up at the Texas Rally on Recovery, which was the National Rally for Recovery Month. And she told her story about what happened to her mom. Her mom became an opiate addict. And she, she was lucky she was intervened on and went to treatment. This little girl talked about what it was like before and then how scared it was she was when her mom came home. And she continued to be scared. But then she got into a, a program that Betty Ford Center runs, in, an outpatient program that, that Betty Ford Center runs in Dallas, Texas. And she found that there were hundreds of other kids just like her. She had thought she was all alone. And she began to get better. And she realized it was never her fault, that she didn't have to take care of her mom. She felt compelled to do that because her mom was so, so sick. And she, was, she told the group how much life meant to her now, and then she thanked her mom for going to treatment. That happened because there was a program to go to. In Detroit, there was a little boy who went to a summer camp that was sponsored by a community coalition, and the head of that community coalition had realized that they weren't really doing completely prevention work because most at-risk kids were getting no help. And so they instituted a summer camp for children of alcoholics and drug addicts. And this little boy was sitting on the stoop outside of the building where the camp had been held. And she was leaving her office. And he called home and she said, can I help you? And he said, no, I'm waiting for my mom. And so she said, well, what are you doing here? And he said, well, I went to this camp. So she said, did you learn anything at the camp? He said, yeah. I learned it wasn't my fault. That woman, that executive director of that community coalition, became the deputy director of the Office of National Drug Control Policy about 10 years later. And that little boy was one of about 500 kids in the southeastern Michigan region who for about 10 years went to a two-week summer camp, 500 a year, multiple camps that were free, teaching them that it wasn't their fault, teaching them that they could have a life without, uh, even if their parents didn't get better, teaching them how to access safe people and tell them their stories so that they could do something to help them. All of those programs, the student assistance program, 
and um, the program at the camp and the program at the Betty Ford Center in, in, um, in Dallas and a program in Palm Spring or Palm Beach with horses, the horse, Horses Healing Hearts is the name of it. There are, summer, there are weekend camps now that are beginning to pop up and every one of them used something called the Children's Program Kit which SAMHSA had asked us to create years ago is a powerful toolkit that has a total prescription for implementing educational support groups for kids. What we know is that the kids' brains change when they find out that it's not their fault, when they find out that they don't have to be afraid when they go home, when they find out that what's the matter at home is that their parent has a brain disease and that they can get better and that there isn't anything that they can do about it except to take care of themselves and to find safe people who will help them take care of themselves. And, and when little children who live in chronic emotional stress because they're fearful and they don't really know what's wrong, when they get the truth and they can understand that it fits with what their experience is, their brains change. Just, that's, that's great. I'm, 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 I'm sorry. I watched it and then I didn't even watch it. I took it to go in there and there's a detail coming out. This is the flyer for the one that's just been produced. One final sentence I should have said before. I'm sorry. Whole families need to recover. When you go over the health care, And if you, when, you, when you're talking to your legislators, we not only want all those terrific recovery programs that were mentioned on this last panel, but we want an extra phrase put in when you're talking about the services and for the impacted family members, including the children. If you just can get our legislators to write that over and over and over again, it will benefit everybody and everyone will have better recovery for the last house. We will have a class on the five minutes just later. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Sis. Next, we have Ada uh, Haynes from Shattuck Group. Ada is a lifelong resident of Connecticut. She began her career with the state of Connecticut at the Department of Children and Youth Services. She joined the Asian American Studies Group in 2001 after, mm -hmm. work, after working with the Cooperative Extension in the School of Agriculture and the Center for Academic Programs. Before that, at the University of Connecticut. She's the mother of three children, Dylan, Amara, Jessica, and Dalton. <laughs> and she's married to Robert Haynes. Her son Dylan is a struggling addict in partial recovery, and she lost her nephew Jerry on February 1st of last year. She has been a Shadow Group ambassador since the program's inception. She was a chair to the AA Silver Festival as an Al Anon representative. She's also a member of every high school in the state of Connecticut. My name is Ada, and I'm a Shatterproof ambassador. I just wanted to quickly tell you a little bit about Shatterproof. Uh, Shatterproof is a national non nonprofit organization dedicated to, dedicated to reducing the devastation that the disease of addiction causes families. Um, our mission is we provide families with evidence-based resources. We foster a community of families. And we allocate for, allocate for policy changes. We invest in developing evidence-based solutions. And we work to end the stigma of substance abuse disorders. And um, I just wanted to say I have my bracelet on, one in three. And uh, if you want to know more, just go on to the Shadowproof website. There's a wealth of information on there. Every, and there's so, it's just such a great organization. And we're looking for more volunteers. Uh, it's, it's a great. So I'm just going to quickly tell you my, my story about what brought me to Shadow Group. My son Dylan, and this is him, is a heroin addict. And um, I was desperately searching for, for help anywhere and everywhere I could think of. I was always trying to find someone who could direct me on the right path for my son's recovery. I also needed someone to understand what I was going through. I needed to reach out, but to who? I was reading the online channel 3 News one day, and I saw Mark Dixon, who's one of our local <coughs> leaders, uh, climbing the building, repelling for addiction. And so I quickly became interested, and I clicked onto the Shadowproof website. Shortly after, I became involved in Shadowproof. 
It was so hard to see my son struggling and going down this road as my family and I felt helpless. We tried everything to help him, but he was so sick, he was so addicted. Only those in this room who've gone through it know what you go through when your son is so, or daughter is, is that way. Uh, we would spend endless nights just lying awake, text, texting him and begging him to come home. He wouldn't answer his phone. We didn't know if he was dead or alive. We were devastated. It was a, a living nightmare. What were we supposed to do and who did we, did we turn to? A few days later, he was arrested for burglary and attempted burglary. The town resident trooper put my son's picture on his website and he announced to everybody who followed his Facebook page what my son had done. He allowed comments to come in from everybody in the town, horrible comments. Living in a small town, everybody knew us. The scarlet letter had been engraved, only it wasn't an S, it was an A. He needed help and I had to do something, but what? Finally, I put myself out there and I said, you know what? Finally, I just said, this is an illness. Who are they to judge? I also called Shadowproof. A woman answered and I told her what happened. She said anyone can throw insults on cyberspace, but it takes a strong, loving mother to pour her heart out to everyone, telling them the story and the truth about addiction. I won't forget her words. She said, Ada, Shadowproof stands with you, be strong. At that moment, something clicked in my head. She was right, this is a disease, and most of the people who wrote in had addiction and issues of themselves. Like I said, it was a small town. I knew then it was high time to fight for the issues, to fight for my son, and to fight for the stigma of addiction. Um, <clears throat> So I attended the opiate epidemic forum at the old state house in Connecticut, and that's where I met the founder of Shadowproof, Gary Mendel, and I found I met other ambassadors. I met many elected officials and caring people from different state agencies. This too has changed my life. Now I'm thinking about going into politics to help Gary with his movement, our movement. Last year, on February 1st, 2016, I lost my nephew, Jerry, to a drug overdose. My sister is here. We never thought he would try heroin. He was so happy, he loved life. He was a world traveler, but he did it and it was cut with fentanyl and he died instantly. I know I am not the same person I was before I found Shatterproof. Shatterproof has given me strength, hope, and the, the ability to face another day to fight to end the stigma of the devastating disease. This has all happened because one man, the founder of Shatterford, loved his son Brian and decided not to give up and fight. My prayers are always with Shatterford, with Gary, with his family, and of course his son, Brian. Thank you very much. Next we have Mary Fitzgerald from the Moya Foundation. Uh, she was appointed as the first uh, executive officer, chief executive officer of the Moya Foundation in July of 2015. Mary has served as a nonprofit executive in Philadelphia for over 13 years with an emphasis on helping youth and other vulnerable populations through emphasis on physical and mental wellness. Mary's work has focused primarily on organizational enhancement, business development, policy writing, strategic planning, and marketing. Mary? Five minutes, please. <laughs> Thank, you. <coughs> Thank you. Good morning. Um, it's really an honor to be here with, with all of these women on the panel and hearing these stories and seeing so many of your friends and family members' photos. It just reaffirms um, our work um, and how much there is to be done for our families and children out there. Um, I grew up uh, the child of an alcoholic, and so many of my friends in New York City um, get into crack and coke dust and you know scholars and athletes turn into people that I no longer recognize. Um, so it, it's really an honor to be in this position and it's so important that we're all here today. 
um, New England Moyer Foundation. We were founded by um, the former Major League Baseball pitcher Jamie Moyer and his wife Karen Phelps Moyer in 2000. Um, and our mission is to provide comfort, hope, and healing to children and their families that are affected by grief and addiction. We provide a lot of resources and really focused on the critical needs of children and teens that, as you've heard today, are really experiencing powerful, overwhelming, and often confusing emotions associated, of course, normally with the substance abuse or the death of a family member. And I think, as we've heard, you know, addiction does not discriminate. Through no fault of their own, there are millions of children and teenagers that find themselves facing extremely difficult and challenging circumstances. And we feel no child should have to deal with these struggles alone. To date, we've served over 34,000 children and families. Um, and we support thousands each year with our programs. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about them. We're here today really to talk about Camp Mariposa, which is a national addiction prevention and mentoring program for children and youth ages 9 to 12. Um, youth attend weekend camps in 12 locations across the country every other month on average. In between those camps, we provide support services for all school-aged children and their family members. Additionally, we also have Camp Erin, um, which was our first program, um, which is a weekend camp for kids ages 6 to 17 that are experiencing the death of someone significant in their lives. Last year, we launched the Moyer Foundation Resource Center. Um, similarly to what you heard with Marsha, it's a uh, a helpline and curated resources for families and children, teachers, professionals that are trying to find local resources um, and help people that you know are dealing with grief or dealing with addiction um, and a lot of other causes that intertwine like anti-bullying and suicide prevention. We're really dedicated to supporting new standards of care and positive outcomes for children in the fields of bereavement and addiction prevention. By raising awareness, we're really trying to reduce the stigma of addiction. Um, increase the understanding and make healing possible for the millions of children out there that are affected. Circumstances beyond their control, as we know, puts these children at risk, much greater risk for depression, suicide, poverty, delinquency, and of course, most likely, substance abuse. The impact of a parent's substance use disorder is evident in the reflection of one of our campers. She said, Camp Mariposa has been an amazing experience for me. Ever since my dad started drinking and got put in jail, things have been tough. I've had to suffer the pain and sadness of losing someone and losing trust. At Camp Mariposa, people help me to let go of worries and have fun. I get to meet many other kids who have had similar experiences and feelings. Camp also gives me a space to be free of my problems. This camp has really helped me. Children living with an addicted family member are four times more likely to become drug or alcohol dependent themselves. <coughs> Our addiction prevention program addresses the needs by providing these kids with the tools they need to take care of themselves, real emphasis on self-care, and cope with their family circumstances that are completely out of their control. One of the primary goals of our program is also to educate. Every day, almost 21,000 individuals aged 12 and over will try drugs or alcohol for the first time. Our focus is to educate our children to delay first use for as long as possible and provide them with the tools they need to reduce the likelihood that they'll develop long-term issues such as anxiety, depression, or other health concerns. We passionately believe no child should have to face these struggles alone. Our free, all of our camp sessions are free for kids and their families. Um, Children are engaging in traditional fun camp activities like some wars and rope courses, um, and then we intertwine education and support exercises that are led by mental health professionals and trained mentors. Um, what we're trying to do is offer a supportive community, as many of you on this panel are as well. We want to connect our campers with other youth that are facing the same issues. Camp Mariposa is really a place where these children transform. The relationships formed can be life-changing, which are so aptly described by one of our campers who said, Camp Mariposa has made me realize that even though someone is smiling and seems happy, they are going through things that a lot of people could not even imagine. At this camp, I have met friends and formed bonds with the counselors. 
because knowing that they have had similar problems makes me feel better about opening up and telling people what happened. It's really a fun camp, and I'm thinking about becoming a junior counselor. Additional educational, social, and mentoring activities are also offered, such as holiday parties, trips to ballparks, um, pro, you know, for campers, alumni, and their families. Um, we're trying to empower these kids to be kids, and sometimes it's the first time in their life they've had that opportunity. At our Camp Mariposa in Kentucky, not one of the children attending had ever heard of the Samoa before, and it was the first time that any of them had met Santa Claus. Today, we offer over 72 weekend camps in 12 locations. Los Angeles, San Diego, here in Washington, D.C., Sarasota and St. Petersburg, Florida, South Bend, Indiana, Kentucky, Eastern Kentucky, New Orleans, New Hampshire, Philadelphia, Seattle, and Southern West Virginia. We partner with accredited mental health and youth serving organizations like the Boys and Girls Clubs to deliver the camp. Recently, we received a $2 million grant from the Department of Justice Office of Juvenile Delinquency and Prevention to sustain and grow the camp program. Who are these kids? Why do they need our help? 85% of them have one or both parents struggling with substance abuse. And 85% of them qualify for free lunches in our schools. And up to 30%, about 30% of our kids are in foster or kinship care. At our recent <coughs> camp in our post in New Hampshire, one third of our children had a family member pass away after an overdose. And some of those children were there to witness the overdose. So what are our kids gaining at our camp? 100% of them say there are adults there that they trust and listen to. 94% of them have said that mindfulness has helped them to deal with their emotions. We're in dire need of additional resources to continue to sustain and expand our services to kids. So we're all here um, to ask for support in fully funded CARA and 21st Century Cures Act. Thank you. Michelle and her husband discovered their sons were struggling with opiate addiction. Since then, Michelle has spent much of her time learning about drug abuse, the criminal justice system, the mental health and health care system, and the recovery industry. Michelle currently runs a local addiction recovery ministry called Beyond Addiction at Salzburg Church, where they host weekly meetings for people seeking recovery and bring awareness and educational opportunities to the church and surrounding the community. Uh, Michelle. Um, thank you for having me here today. I'm actually here speaking on behalf of Barbara Fioso from the Addicts Mom. She really wanted to be here, but she's having foot surgery, so she can't be with us. We have, if you, I'll just let that play as I'm speaking, but we have some slides of the Addicts Mom. Is that keeping me? <laughs> um, so I'll just read what she wrote for you. When I discovered that my two sons were using drugs, my life fell apart. For months I felt isolation, desperation, and unbearable heartache. I couldn't function, I couldn't sleep, I couldn't work. All I did was focus on my two sons. My family suffered, my friendship suffered, and I walked away from my own very successful business in order to dedicate myself to my sons and their illness. Deep inside I knew that there were many other mothers suffering as I was. I wanted to create a place for all addicts moms to gather. A safe place where they would have the freedom to share their image without the burden of shame and guilt that comes with having an addicted child. Thus, the Addicts Mom was born. So the Addicts Mom was actually founded 10 years ago. Um, right now, we have approximately 85,000 members over all the groups. The main um, closed Facebook group last June had 22,000 members. Right now, it has almost 60,000 members. So. Wonderful that we grew that much, but horribly sad that there's that many moms that need support. Um, like Doug mentioned, our two sons struggle with heroin addiction. This is them five years ago before we heard about heroin or opiates or knew any of the stuff that we knew now. When I came to Carol last spring, my boys, both of them, had just gone into a recovery kind of a or situation where we gave them a one way to get out of the state. And so they were just newly there. We didn't know what was going to happen. Our older son next month will be one year in recovery as our beautiful little five month old grandson. Doing really well. <laughs> Unfortunately, 
Actually, our younger son had a slip up, but the good news is he was willing and um, able to get back into treatment. So he's currently in an inpatient facility in Florida, and he's also doing well. So the video shows a bunch of cool things that the Addicts Mom is doing. There's a number of Addicts Moms here at CARA testifying. Barbara herself was awarded a champion of change at the White House last year. So lots of media attention and lots of accolades, but all of that is secondary to what the mission of the Addicts Mom is. The Addicts Mom is to support moms. And as someone mentioned, unless, unless you live that life, you, you don't understand it. And you don't want to talk to your neighbor or your friends. And sometimes even your family you can't even talk to. So this group of moms that's there basically 24-7 for you to bend, to cry, um, you know, to celebrate successes, or to ask for advice or help or direction. And so it really is a lifeline to some of the moms. It, it's really incredible to watch, um, you know, a mom will post something, a new mom I just found out, and literally within minutes she'll have, you know, hundreds of comments of support or direction or ideas or just to say, you know, I've been there and I'm here for you and I'm praying for you. So that's really awesome. Um, like I said, we have almost 60,000 members in our main support group, and those are unique members. We don't allow treatment providers, we don't allow um, family members that are actively using. Every person who requests gets a personal contact from one of our administrators to make sure they're a right fit for the group. We have about 150 volunteers, and so these are just other addicts moms who give their time, some of them almost full time, just to be in our groups and watch to make sure that they're safe and to give support to other people. We also have recently started offering specialty groups for single moms, moms who maybe have children who um, are addicted and pregnant. We have a spiritual group. We just started um, support for incarcerated children. And then um, just our latest group was an advocacy group. Within the first 30 minutes of announcing the group, we had 400 requests to be in it. So we're definitely getting to a point where moms want to be heard and they want to speak out and do something and help make change. That is all I have. We see your work all the time on Facebook. And uh, I'd also like to thank the addict's dad. Yeah. <laughs> for having me here today. My name is Susan Messenger, and my job title is MOM, with a capital M-O-M, and that stands for a Mother on Mission. October 23rd, 2014 was the worst day of my life. My son, Carlton Frederick Messenger II, died of fentanyl intoxication. Unbeknownst to me at the time, this is the day I would become a Mother on Mission. Many people ask me how I can speak out and tell Carl's story. My answer is how, how can I not tell what happened to Carl and our family? The only way to get things to change is to be vocal to our elected officials and community members. That is why this is my second time on the Hill speaking out regarding the opiate epidemic and what it has done to my family. Last year, I told Carl's story when I visited DC and I will give you just a short version of what happened. We found out Carl was using heroin on and off for a year. We had one month's notice from the time we found out until he died. We immediately thought, not my child, how can this be? We are two loving parents uh, with two great sons. Both parents are college educated and we own a dental office in Plymouth, New Hampshire. Our children went to private schools and were given many opportunities in life. We are your average American family. We're not drug users. Carl was a college graduate who started his own eBay business selling vintage transformer toys. I immediately thought, this can't be happening to my family, not my son. I also thought, we are your average American family. This doesn't happen to people like us. We got him into detox immediately, which is no easy task to do since our insurance had restrictions on drug detox. They would only pay for alcohol detox, since drug detox is not considered life-threatening per the insurance company. 
I was told by the insurance company to lie when he goes into detox and say that he has alcohol issue so that they would take him. We paid for the detox out of our own pocket. When he came out of detox, he was doing very well. However, we went to see his doctor for an upper respiratory infection. His doctor never saw him. He saw another doctor. His primary care physician never wrote in his chart. He had just come out of detox for heroin overdose. Apparently, it's at the doctor's discretion as to whether or not what he writes in the chart for the notes of the patient. It's not up to the patient or the parent. He was given cough medicine called Cheritussin AC syrup. We didn't know the AC stood for coding. Yeah. I thought it was Jerry cough medicine. Needless to say, the use of this cough medicine triggered him to use again. This time, his drug dealer sold him 100% fentanyl. It killed my son instantly. I found him in his bathroom, blue, cold, and dead. I can't get that image out of my head. The same weekend Carl died, six other young people overdosed on fentanyl in a 30-mile radius of where we live. Three were saved with Narcan, and three others died, including my son. Narcan would have helped Carl. He was alone and died instantly. I knew shortly after Carl died that I needed to do something to change what's happening to our communities, our states, and our country. I knew I needed to do something so no other family would have to go through what our family, extended family, and friends have had to deal with. We are a country, and we're losing a whole generation of young people. We need to put services in place to help these young people and their families before it's too late. People ask me what's the answer to the opioid crisis. I don't have the answer. The crisis is a multifaceted problem. There's no silver bullet for this problem. Resources need to be made available in all key six elements of comprehensive response to addiction, prevention, treatment, recovery, overdose reversal, law enforcement, and criminal justice reform. In my community, I have reached out to different government groups and gave testimony to the New Hampshire Legislative Opiate Epidemic Task Force about Carl's story. I was involved in roundtable discussions headed by Annie Custer in the New Hampshire area. I spoke at Teach Our Children Well, Truth About Drugs. My presentation was titled, The System Isn't Working. I testified last May to the Bipartisan Drug Task Force in Washington, D.C. at Andy Custer's invitation. On June 2016, Andy Custer introduced to the House of Representatives Carl's Law. It would require prescription medications to include a warning label if the drug contains opiates it could cause drug-seeking behavior. We are now reintroducing it this week, and um, it will also be introduced um, on the House side as well. Or oh, I'm sorry, the Senate side as well. Uh, I'm currently working on starting a sober house called Carl's House in Plymouth, New Hampshire, and a recovery center in my hometown. I am motivated by two things. One, things need to change with regard to the stigma of drug addiction. Thinking this is not my family and can't happen to my family. You need to understand it can and might possibly happen to your family or someone you know. 144 people a day are dying of drug overdoses. The second motivating factor is I don't want anyone else to have to go through the hell that my family and I have lived the last 28 months and five days. Everyone hears stories about what happened to the person using drugs, but no one ever talks about the family member's experience, what their loved one, when their loved one dies of a drug overdose. You've heard Carl's story. You've heard a little bit of my story. But I wanted to give you a perspective on my other son, Adam. Six months after his brother died, he wrote an essay entitled, Now an Only Child. He read this to the entire student body during their weekly school meeting, and I heard from his advisor there wasn't a dry eye in the house. I like to read part of his essay. I think this essay is pretty profound for someone who was 16 years old at the time he wrote it. Do I have time to read it? I'll just, I'm just not going to read the whole thing. Okay. A New Only Child by Adam Messenger. It's been almost five months since my brother died. I still can't speak super openly on the topic, so I chose to write an essay that I would read for the whole school community. 
I chose to write this essay because I felt that it would be a big step forward for me. Being a kid whose brother died is something that I don't always want to be synonymous with my name. When I decided to write this essay, I did it to be about my brother and the stupid choice he made. I wanted it to be about me. I wanted this to be my story. I wanted it to not be too sad because I never know how to properly react when something is too emotional. My brother Carl was born October 31st, 1989, and died of a drug overdose on October 23rd, 2014, five or eight days before his 25th birthday. I don't think it's important to the story to include what type of drug or what exactly went down. The only thing that happens is that he died of a drug overdose. On October 23rd, I was sitting in the student lounge when I got a call from my mom that Carl had overdosed. I kept saying to myself that he was fine and we would all be fine in a week. When I pulled into my driveway, the lights of the ambulances and police cars illuminated the usually dark, dark driveway. I ran inside and knew that this would not go over soon. He died before the ambulance even arrived. I don't want to say too much about the situation, but it wasn't suicide. He wasn't the kind of person who would have committed suicide. Soon enough, my house was full of people who had once known Carl. The dark driveway now overpopulated with cars, blocking, another, blocking one another in. It became a regular occurrence to see people who had met only a few times weeping on the couch in our living room. I didn't know how to handle the situation. What should I say? How much should I say? A lot of the questions that are still for the most part, unanswered. People would ask me, how are you doing? And I was, would always reply, good. But the truth was, I wasn't good. But I didn't want them to know. So I would say, good, or thanks so much. That's so nice. And they thought that they would say something about how great Carl was. It became a routine of some same words over and over again. While I appreciated the people who wanted to talk about Carl and share their sympathies, all it did was remind me of my current situation. It became something that I thought about every day. And a week earlier, it would have felt like a confusing dream. Now it's a harsh reality. I see reminders of it everywhere. It didn't help that our house was filled with sympathy flowers with sweet notes attached. But time passed, and I began to notice new things. Carl's room became my mom's office. We waited a good amount of time, but couldn't deal with the constant reminder of what was, what was once. Through time, I started to notice other people's family dynamics. I became unintentionally <coughs> jealous of those who had siblings or good family structure. It was jealousy mixed with regret, regret that I would never be able to have that kind of bond ever again. I looked at those who came to pay their respects with the utmost contempt, contempt in the nicest way possible, of course. I wasn't angry with them, but I was jealous of them for the sole reason that they didn't have to deal with what I was dealing with. My contempt came to a peak a week after Carl's death. A friend of my mom's came to see us and share her sympathies. Through all her nice words, I could only see a woman who would leave my house and go back home to a perfect life, one that I would never have again. It was still super nice of her to show up and say such nice things, but I felt cheated. A month or so later, my mom told me that her friend would be living with us for a few months. Apparently, her husband and she were fighting and it became an unsafe environment, so she had to leave. I felt so ignorant in that moment. Who was I to assume that this woman had a perfect life waiting for her home? I knew nothing about her other than the fact that she was a friend of my mom's. It was wrong of me to assume her life was perfect. It was wrong of me to make it seem like I'm the first person ever to have something terrible happen to them. If I've learned anything from this experience, it is that everyone has something going on in their life. There's just so much happening to think the surface that the world would never see it. And then he just goes on to say one or two great things. I know we're running out of time, but that was his perspective. I thought it was important that you knew. All right, I'd like to thank you all for coming, and uh, I guess we all got to head out there to Hill Day. Make this trip valuable. Get valued by contributing.